All right, welcome back to part four of this VFX tutorial series. In the last part, we looked at shot A, we got that composited. We still have to go back to shot A and then we'll have to make some tweaks and stuff like that. But we need to do the same treatment to shot B. But shot B is a bit more involved than shot A. So anything that's a, like a repeat of shot A, you can just refer back to that tutorial for. But then there's a lot of other new things that we have to do in shot B. So the very first thing that we have to do, let me just tidy up these folders here, open up shot B and then grab the sequences for shot B. We'll pull these above the Petri dish base and you can see that they, these are not tracked so we need to do that i'll pull ao above blending mode for ao is going to be multiply and then the shot b glass we'll pull that above all of these and for now we'll just turn off this one and ao so to add this layer to the track we're going to go back to the plates open up track data petri dish is the one that we need um, if you wanted to change this so it matched shot a i think we called this one 3d object you can just do that pretty easily and then we can go back to create track data. Then it's confirmed 3D object. Good. And then export to shot B version one, apply and export. And then we're going to do that again on AO and on the glass. So now when we play this forward, you can see that this is tracking with it. Let's turn off this base texture like that. And the next part is we need to realign this so it matches shot A. So what makes this a little bit tricky is that we have to look at shot A and look at the placement of each paint effect growth, each piece, and that needs to be in the same place in shot B. Let's lock the composition for shot A, go back to the project window, double click Petri dish shot B, drag the comp to the side so then we can see both at the same time. So zooming in here, we need to have a look and find these key pieces. Like this one's, uh, they're gonna be larger in shot B because they're growing upwards. Do keep that in mind. So it's probably better to try to do this around frame 45-ish, somewhere around there. But they're still gonna be a bit bigger, but these two are matching. Try to find the ones that are matching around the edges. So you need to try to look at the distance it is to the edge of the Petri dish. So to do that, once again, we're just gonna grab a power pin. I'm gonna minimize the Petri dish base B there. And then, the power pin can go above the corner pin. Now remember, it is important that you put this above the corner pin, otherwise this is not going to work. So we're just gonna try to pull these edges in. And this is pretty tricky because they are all moving. Try something more like that. But we're looking at the distance from the edge and we're trying to get that as close as we can. So there's gonna be a lot of things in this tutorial that I'm just going to have to just kind of skip over or speed up because otherwise this video is gonna be really long. Power pin is a good tool, but it is a little bit tricky because anytime that you move one of the corners, they all kind of move. So it is a good tool, but uh, it does take a little bit of tweaking to get it right. But I think that looks pretty close. I think looking at the edges, we have some around the this rim, like right on that rim that we're gonna have to fix later. But I think for now that will be okay. Next, let's go ahead and add in that base texture. So we can go back to shot A's base texture for this, grab all of these layers, copy them, go into Petri dish base B, paste these in. And let me turn on the transparency. We don't want this black background, so remove that. So it should be that. All right, turn this layer on. And then we have to do the same thing with this. Grab another power pin, pull that above the existing corner pin. And then this one, we need to pull down quite a bit. I think the placement looks fairly accurate there. Like anything else in this video, we can tweak it later. But let's go ahead and then grab some of the color correction and add the correct blending mode. So for example, here I'm base B, going up to overlay, I'll match it a little bit better. And then in shot A, although the lighting's slightly different, we can grab the curves, paste that in there. And then we also can grab the color correction, the entire layer, and then paste that in here as well. The lighting is slightly different or the color correction could be slightly different on both of these, but I think that works fairly well. So let's take this power pin, and we're gonna copy that onto AO. Make sure this is above the existing corner pin. And then the shot B glass, so if we turn this layer on, this one is just going to be probably additive. I think that will be okay. Or we could do something like um, exclusion. So exclusion is going to just dim it down a little bit. Here, if we add another power pin, we can just pull this in from the sides. It's sticking out over the edges a little bit too much. I'm just gonna pull this down more like that. Okay, then AO, we can turn this one on. And this is looking pretty good. Okay, to get rid of these annoying motion paths, 
Let's go up to view, view options, and then turn off motion paths and keyframes. Click OK, and then those go away. Otherwise, it's kind of, they just get in the way of things. So the next thing that we have to do, take shot B, and then we have to extract all the passes out and then set up Z depth. So if you don't remember what to do, you should have a look at the previous part where we went over that. I'm not going to go over it again. I'm just going to speed up the video or, or just jump ahead to that point. But after that is done, then we can continue with the new things for shot B. All right, so now I've got all of the passes composited with the Z depth as well. On the defocus control, I have the master camera lens blur, which is using that map. Then I just have an extra global camera lens blur just to add blur to everything regardless of that map. So I have two effects on both of these. And any one of these passes, if we scroll down, you can see there's two, but they're both referencing the effects on defocus control. Okay, so there are obvious problems with this, and I just wanted to go ahead and show you some that happened right away. So I'm gonna render a preview of this, and then we'll take a look at that and then identify areas that we need to fix. So we can see that there's a track slide here, which is a little unusual because Generally, this is a pretty easy one to track, but we do have a slide. And right here at the end, after it's put down, you can see, if we look at the right-hand side here, that everything kind of just stretches out to the right. So that's kind of weird and annoying. It doesn't actually start until around frame 142, 143 ish. The easiest way to solve this is simply delete all the tracking data after frame 42, because nothing moves. So we shouldn't even need tracking information there. So let's go ahead and do that and select all the layers that use that track then we're going to open up the corner pin then we're going to click U and we're going to scroll all the way up to the top here and then frame 43 is where the cursor is and we're just going to select just marquee select all of the layers transforms from 43 onwards then just click delete then that problem goes away we also have an issue at the very beginning here where we can see that some of the paint effects get a little bit too low they're too close to the edge so we need to pull those back up so I think everything looks pretty good at frame 20 and to do this, I think the easiest way is going to be to solo the plate. Let me go ahead and just collapse all these layers. Then we'll just turn on GI and then we'll animate this power pin. So we can see that there's an issue here where they slide around a little bit. So everything looks good at frame 29, 30. So I'll set keyframes here at 29 for the power pin. Now we could add a separate power pin for this, but I think it'll be fine just as it is. Click U and then we're gonna just go backwards a few frames. And there's one slide here. So we need to stretch these over to the left. And then we need to go back and just check to make sure we haven't made that worse. So right there now there's another slide. So we can set manual keyframes here at frame 28. So right here, we can push these over. So you just have to go frame by frame and kind of compare the positions. I think that looks pretty good. Then at frame 18, I'll set new keyframes. Then if we go forward till about frame 14 or 13, we can see these are too close to the edge. We're just going to pull up this line just a little bit, and that should fix that issue. So then we need to go to the first frame that we started keyframing. So in this case, it's frame 13 for me. We can copy this power pin and then we can go layer by layer and just paste that in and it will paste beginning on frame 13 and it will override the existing power pin. Okay. Next, we need to add motion blur to this. So all of these that move, so this, all of these layers move, we'll turn on motion blur Then we can unsolo those layers and have another look. All right, so there are still a few things that we need to do here. One issue here is, especially at the end, they're very, very dark. And this is not something that we can fix in After Effects. The problem is some of the petals here just are not reflective enough. So this is something I would have to go back to Maya to fix. I think I will do that later on, but uh, that will not be part of the tutorial. Because they look quite good there, I think. But then when they open up, they cast themselves in shadow. And then there's just not enough light hitting the top. There are just not enough reflections at the top. Okay, so we also have to rotoscope the finger, and then we have to deal with this rim. So the rim is actually a little bit interesting how we're going to do it, and then the rotoscoping is fairly straightforward. So let's go ahead and fix this rim. So if you recall earlier, we actually tracked this section of the front. So if we go back into Mocha here, we have the rim, this front section that we did a transform track on, not a corner pin track. So we're going to exit out of that. We're going to duplicate our plates, call this rim, and then we're going to move rim all the way up to the top. Then we're going to grab a new solid, 
call this rim mat, turn that layer off. And then we just need to go over this section of the rim here. If I turn off this rim that we just added, we can see these are just right at the rim edge here. If you have some that go lower down, it's the same technique here. Although the rim itself needs to be more opaque and uh, the ref we actually have a lot higher refraction. So you would see some kind of color maybe going through it, but it's not going to be that strong. But I'll show you this in case you have some that come lower as well. So let's turn on the rim, go up to tracking data, and then we're going to do create track data, rim, click OK. Then we're going to export that to the rim mat. Now this is not a corner pin, this is just a transform track and then click apply export. Then on the rim mat, grab a pen tool and then we're just going to outline the rim like that. Don't forget, you can hold down the control key on these tangents just to break them. Then you can change the curve. You can have it differently depending on which side you're, you're working with. If I turn this layer on and now move it backwards, it should move with the dish. So there's a part here where it's sliding a little bit. So we'll go ahead and fix that. So click M. It was good in its current position at around frame 45 or 43 or whatever, wherever the dish stops moving. So we'll keyframe up the mask path, then go backwards again. We'll turn this layer off just so we can see that rim and then just pull up the points so they line up. This is like really, really easy rotoscoping. So it might just be a little bit time consuming to do, but it's not technically challenging. And this really slides here. It's complete, this, I think the track just stopped. So we'll pull these back up. Now this is gonna be completely out of focus. So if you're slightly off, it doesn't really matter. It's not gonna be noticeable at all. We'll come back down. Maybe we can get a little bit more of it in focus. We can place it a little bit better. That looks decent enough for the roto. We'll set this rim to be alpha. So then it covers up this section here. Now we need to feather this just a little bit, maybe five to 10 pixels. So that looks a little bit better. Now, if you have paint effects that come a little, a little bit lower, you really should blur them a little bit and they should be slightly less opaque. So what we're gonna do in order to achieve that, and in fact, on this rim, I could add just a little bit of coloring on this rim. So we can take a copy of the Shot B Growth Beauty, just duplicate this, pull this above the rim mat, and then we can duplicate the rim mat as well. Then we can take both of these layers, pre-compose them. We'll just call this rim mat with growth, Let's go inside here. I'll toggle the transparency on, put both of these on. Growth goes underneath, and then the track mat will be set to alpha. So now it's only selecting those paint effects that were within that rim. So then we can turn this layer off and then grab an adjustment layer. Let's call that rim growth adjustment or something. We can grab a fast blur, pull this over. So if I turn off the rim so you can see what this is gonna do a little bit more clearly, with the rim growth adjustment layer, Using the mat as an alpha, we can increase the blur radius. We could do something like five, and then it's going to blur it. Now, the mat itself is not blurred, so we do need to blur that a little bit too. We can grab the fast box blur and then we could do the same amount. But then on this layer, we could change the saturation very slightly, going to be a little less saturated. You could change the color or whatever. Then on the rim, the rim would actually, these layers would go on top turn on the rim layer, go to opacity, and then we could just lower the opacity a little bit, more like 70%. That looks pr pretty cool. So a little bit scraping through, but it is a little bit blurred. Pull that back up to 75 or so. Not very much of it would show up on the rim, but that now looks a little bit better. Maybe even just a little bit more. I don't really want that much color showing through there. Okay, so next we have to rotoscope the fingers. This process is pretty easy. Grab a new solid. Now for this, I'll do two individual layers for this. And because we tracked the thumb and the index finger, you can see we could use this as part of our rotoscoping. So this is completely optional. You do not have to do this, but if you go up to track data, open up the fingers folder, grab the index finger, click OK. This again is just a transform track. You never really want to use corner pins with masks. Then apply this one to index finger roto, click apply. Then on this layer, we can start adding in our rotoscoping. Now we're really only interested in the parts that have contact with the pen effects. We don't care about the top part. I'm gonna go and change the color here to make this stand out a little bit better. Pull this back up. Now this, there is quite a lot of blur here. I would not add motion blur to roto masks. You can, and sometimes it's okay to do that, but I think more often than not, it's a little bit counterintuitive and it will end up blurring your roto too much and allowing too much in, but that's completely up to you. I'm gonna to try to include some of that blur and then just maybe go halfway into the blur and then just feather it. So at this point, the paint effects should still be pretty low. So I know that I don't need to bother rotoscoping anything more than this edge.
So let me go ahead and finish this. And then you do the same thing for the thumb as well. All right, so when you have both of those roto masks finished, I'm not gonna bother feathering them until we actually see how they look, but I'm gonna grab both of these, pre-compose them, call them finger roto, and click okay. This layer can be turned off. And the easiest way to do this is simply put a copy of this layer above every single one of these passes and the dish roto itself. I'm gonna change the color here to dark green just so they stand out a little bit more. Then I'm gonna duplicate one over each one of these passes. We're gonna select all of the layers that require that mat and switch them to alpha inverted on solo the plates. Then we need to go ahead and feather it. You could also blur them as well, but it doesn't particularly matter. I'm going to push this over and I'm gonna lock this composition now and then open up one of the roto mats. They're all the same. Now inside here, it would be a good idea to add a fill effect just so we can see them without having to turn off our transparency. We'll select both of these and then this one, we can maybe feather these 10 pixels or so. This one is gonna take a little bit more work. There's a, a lot of detail there. So we can open up the mask expansion. Might do like a value of negative, maybe 1.5 or so. Maybe just five for the feathering. A little bit too much of a gap here. Another really useful thing you can do is grab the plates, paste them in, then set them as a guide layer. So then they won't show back up over the comp, but then you have another reference. So here I was a little bit sloppy with the masks. Pull that back up. That looks a little bit better. Rotoscoping is gonna take a little bit of time to do. So while it's quite easy, it, it is really time consuming. So I'm not gonna tweak all of this here. I, I'll finish it up for the final preview of this, but I'm not going to show it here. Otherwise this video will be like hours long probably. If I spent time doing that on all the technical fixes, let's have a look at the thumb. I don't think, I only really was requiring the thumb a little bit further on where it passes this area. So that looks, that looks fine. So the only other thing that we need to rotoscope is gonna be the shadow. So there is a distinct area where the finger casts a shadow. Now for the Petri dish base texture, we don't need to worry about it because we're using the overlay blending mode. But if we look at the paint effects, they're not getting darker. If you wanted to do this really, really accurately, you'd really wanna have that finger in Maya. So then it would block highlights and block reflections as well. But in this case, we can get away with it just by rotoing kind of a, a matte layer over it and then adding that with an adjustment layer. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna solo our plates again. Call this finger shadow. And this can be pretty rough. Something kind of like that. Now this area also gets a little bit of shadow too. So for that, we'll actually just use a mask feather adjustment. We can just grab the feather tool and then just pull up the feather here. Doesn't really matter about this edge. Do this part as well. So it just feathers it just in those areas. And then I'll go ahead and just animate this over a few frames. Now we could have probably attached this to the Petri dish track, but uh, this is pretty quick to do. So let's unsolo the plates, we'll grab this finger shadow, pull this all the way up underneath our CC. Then we're gonna grab another copy of the growth beauty, basically just to use the alpha for it. We're gonna select both of these, call that finger shadow mat. Go inside here. We don't actually need this CC layer. We're gonna take shot beauty, pull this under, turn it on. And this is going to use the alpha and then just turn off the finger shadow. Now only the pin effects underneath that shadow are gonna be affected. We can feather this quite a lot, 40 pixels or so. That might be a little bit strong. More like that maybe. Go back to shot B. Then we need to add an adjustment layer. Call that finger shadow adjustment, pull it underneath the mat, set it to alpha. Then on the adjustment layer, we can just grab a curves or something, pull this down, and now we're darkening down the paint effects that are supposed to be underneath the finger. So that's a pretty quick and effective way to do it. We don't want to crush the blacks too much, but I think around there is pretty good. That's a good way to cheat it, okay? I think this is looking pretty good, but if we compare this to shot A, they're looking a little bit like overly saturated and a little bit brighter. Now there is more of a direct light here, if you can see in the table, like it is in light. But if we look at the color of the paint effects in shot A, in shot A, they're 
a lot less saturated. So let's go into the lighting layer. This is what's going to really affect the color. And then we'll lower the saturation, maybe by an additional 10 or so. Then on the reflection, we might just drop that down a little bit, a thing more like that. This is more in shadow, so we do have to keep that in mind as well. Now for the glass rim, these are a lot brighter than what they're supposed to be reflecting. We'll go back to this shot B glass. Let's call this shot B glass reflection. So we'll grab a camera lens blur. We'll also grab a curves. So that's gonna blur it down. And then on the curves, pull this down so they're a lot darker. Now we do wanna see them, but they need to be a lot darker. So I think, so I think that looks better. I think they're just too saturated now. Grab a hue and saturation. We can just tone down the color there, more like that. Again, we can, we can tweak this later, but I think this is looking pretty good. Go back to our defocus layer. I think this is a little bit too blurry. So on the extra blur, I'm just going to lower that a little bit. Should sharpen that up very slightly. Now there is a little bit more of a greenish tint to this. I'm gonna go back to that lighting pass. And then I'm just going to just kind of nudge the hue, hue degrees more. That kind of makes it very slightly more of a yellowish red. I think that looks a little bit better. Okay, now I'm probably going to make some other tweaks between now and when I show the final result of this, but I think this is looking pretty good. So the other thing is the color correction. So if we go back to our color correction here, I'm going to grab another curves just so we can go back and then reference the original one. This one seems to have a little bit less contrast. If we look here, the lighting is a lot brighter and then this just is not that bright. So I just want to bump up the midtones a little bit. Maybe I don't want to lift the black values very much. I think that looks a little bit better. And then also on the blue channel, we could just add just a tad more blue very, very slightly, just so they seem like they're more aligned. So with a slight adjustment, it's gone from more greenish to a bit more bluish. To zoom in here, do that just a little bit more maybe. Again, we can play around with this for days. On the Petri dish base texture, I think I might need to go back to the blue channel here and just add a bit of blue, add a bit of blue into this. I think that looks a little bit better. Okay, also the black values here look a little bit dark, so that's mostly going to be controlled by the GI. Bump that up just a little bit more. You have to be pretty careful with that though. Okay, probably going to tweak that as well. Okay, let's go back to shot A because there's a few things that I think we overlooked last time. So one of those was the defocus. So at the very beginning, this thing should start to defocus. So we need to match the rack focus. So at around frame, let's see, so by frame 70, the background is out of focus and the foreground is in focus, I think. So what we can do here on our defocus control, grab a camera lens blur, we'll call this rack camera lens blur. And then on our AO, we'll grab another camera lens blur, Basically, we're just going to attach these like we did with the regular defocus. I'll call this one rack camera lens blur. Hold down alt, attach it to the rack camera lens blur of the master layer. Then we're going to have to go through each one of these layers down here and then manually add another camera lens blur. And the reason is we already have a camera lens blur added. So if we copy and paste the lens blur, it's going to override the one that was originally there. So we have to have a second one. Now we can go back to AO and copy this rack focus one and then just paste that one over the new camera lens blur that we just added. So on our defocus control at the very beginning here at frame 70, this should be at zero because the focus is now on the Petri dish. We'll keyframe that. And I think it's around frame 52 where the background starts to go out of focus. So then we'll set this to be something like 15. That's pretty blurry. I think we could go a little bit more, something more like that. Okay, so that's now going to animate. So the focus is going to animate with it. Just seen here though, on the growth AO layer, motion blur should be added. And on the Petri dish base layer should also be added there. And then at the end, I think there's a part where they stop moving right here at 215, they stop. So what we need to do is grab all of these layers that move and then we need to trim them click Alt right bracket, then by frame 216, they're gone. There's also another issue here by the fact that this is very blurry, but then the tracking stops. And I think I mentioned this last time that you should continue on the track. So the motion blur also keeps going. So go to frame 216. Then we're just going to move these over to the right with the shift arrow keys, just to add some extra blur. So if you look down here, we're just using the arrow keys, just shifting those over a few pixels. So maybe like 50 pixels or so. 
So when we go back, the blur kind of looks a little bit better like that. Cool. Okay, so I think this one is now ready. So there are tweaks that we can do on both of these, but I think this is a good start. This is definitely something you could show a client and with a little bit more work, this could become a final effect. All right, so I'm gonna go back into Maya. I'm gonna fix some of the issues with the petals. Just being a little bit dark and this entire scene just looks a little bit dark so i might play around with some of the materials there but overall this is as much as i really wanted to cover with this try to make your own effects anyway and just use this as a reference but this would be a good start at compositing so i'll show you the final result in a moment and then the original one again that i had done a few years ago so i tried to follow that pretty similarly but this one did change a bit but the same techniques are involved. I'm gonna pop back over to Maya, render out a new version and show you that. Now, if you guys also do the same thing, in Maya, don't render over the version that you previously rendered. So if you have a version one, definitely make a second version, a version two. And then when it comes to reload those, all you do is go up to the sequence you want to replace with the new version, right click, replace footage, file, and then you just go find the, the new version that you rendered out. And then you don't have to recomposite anything, it'll just kind of fall into place, okay? So here are the final results for shot A and shot B. So on shot B, I went into Maya and re-rendered out a version with slightly more reflective petals. And then I just did some tweaking to the color correction. Also on shot B, there's still a tracking issue towards the beginning, which would require just a bit more time with the corner pins. But overall, this should give you a pretty good idea of the workflow that's required to produce a visual effects shot like this and how to deliver something that would be acceptable to show a client. All right, so hope you guys enjoyed it. If you learned something, drop a like. If you have any questions, post a comment. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next time. Peace.